Great. Thanks, Roger. Um, so I thought what I would do is um, maybe dig just a little bit deeper into the methodology of how we actually measure forces and maybe talk a little bit about the different tools that have been developed and what are some of the strengths and weaknesses, limitations of the various methods. And I, I thought that would be useful for you guys. Uh, along the way, I'll also uh, show you just a couple of examples of how we've used those tools to try to understand a little bit more about uh, uh, traction forces uh, in biology. And uh, obviously, uh, uh, feel free to interrupt at any point. Uh, I want this to be sort of open and interactive. So, um, so the, the first thing I wanted to just uh, mention, I, I know that uh, Ray Keller gave you a nice lecture about uh, morphogenesis and sort of development. And the reason why I wanted to sort of remind you about those is that these are essentially uh, force-mediated processes, right? Uh, cells, when they change their shape within these structures, um, in order to, to generate these kind of massive movements, those require forces. And uh, one of the things that uh, the field is very interested in is trying to understand how those forces are used in order to drive these developmental processes in the first place, how you get from sort of a spherical, perfectly apparently uniform uh, egg into something that is a very complex uh, 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 body. The other thing that is also important is to realize that these forces are not just used to change uh, cell shape or uh, multicellular structure. Um, but uh, as Mike mentioned, these forces also drive sort of intracellular structures such as adhesions, uh, cytoskeletal organization, et cetera. I think I pulled this off of your website. Um, now, one of the things that uh, exists within the dogma of embryogenesis is this notion that uh, genetic programs essentially drive all of the formation of these tissues. So you have certain um, tightly controlled uh, gene expression programs that will turn on and those will drive, say, the differentiation of the various tissue types within the body during this sort of very fast embryogenesis process. And it's thought that those gene programs can also regulate forces by simply expressing different levels of actin or myosin or, or other things like this, right? Uh, and through that, uh, uh, alter changes in cell shape. So you can sort of conceptually think of this genetic program as, as sort of the master regulator that might link differentiation, changes in cell shape, changes in mechanics. Um, we're not sure if this is right. Uh, in fact, I'm pretty sure it's not entirely right. Um, and the reason why we, we think that is that uh, we think that there's also another set of relationships that put forces at the top of this, this sort of triangle. Uh, we know that forces can uh, feed back to regulate genetic programs. So this whole area of sort of mechanotransduction, how when you pull on a tissue, it changes the behavior of those tissues, not mechanically, but biologically. Those cells will activate and proliferate and, and adapt to those forces. This is why we exercise and, and strengthen our musculoskeletal system. We also know that these forces can regulate differentiation of cells. So stem cells, uh, cancer cells, all of these are affected by forces. And obviously forces can regulate cell shapes. So another dogma that is something that I want you to take away is this notion that perhaps forces are the integrating feature that links these differentiation processes uh, during morphogenesis so that the cell that is sitting at the right place during this process differentiates into the right cell, that forces might actually be the guiding principle that links them, okay? So all of that is to tell you that these traction forces that cells generate are really important. And there have been a, a number of different methods that have been developed over the years to try to uh, identify and measure those forces. The, the first one that really uh, put cellular forces on the map was this one that was 
uh, started by Albert Harris uh, many, many years ago, uh, around 1980. I think he had several papers in this area. What he did was he basically took uh, a silicone oil, uh, silicone no different than the, the sort of silicone lubricants that we use, and uh, by just passing that liquid through a flame, the, the heat would polymerize a skin uh, on the surface of that oil. So you imagine sort of a solid uh, rubber-like skin on the surface of a viscous liquid. And then he put cells on top. And this is what he saw. So I don't know if you can see it, but here's one cell, here's one cell, and here's one cell. And what you immediately notice is that the cells are sort of wrinkling this, this skin on the surface. And if you pop those cells off, the wrinkles sort of relax and come back down, right? Uh, so uh, in some ways, it's similar to sort of you sitting on top of, let's say, your, your bed sheet and sort of moving around, and that's causing wrinkling, except that the bed sheet is not elastic, right? When you walk off, the bed is wrinkled. Uh, whereas here, it, it smooths back out because it's under tension. So. Uh, several people spent maybe about 10 years using this system to simply say, when do forces exist? They put cells on, they could sort of tell when there were forces. And at some point, people started wanting to know not just a digital answer, is there force or is there not force, but is there more force and how much more force? And so uh, it turns out that this problem of sort of looking at this buckling, if you will, is fairly complicated, right? Um, you can generate uh, a wide range of forces that would change the degree of buckling. And so now you're sort of trying to do the inverse problem where you see buckling and you're trying to back out how much force there is. And that turns out to be a highly nonlinear process, so it's very hard to, to quantify. So uh, they started, people started looking at other kinds of substrates that maybe would deform in, in response to cell contractions. And uh, there was a seminal paper in actually 1997 by a gentleman named Yuli Wang. And he developed these methods where he would take polyacrylamide gels, which are not sticky to proteins. This is why we use them in uh, running Western blots, right? Proteins can run through the gel without sticking to it. But he found a way to couple, covalently couple, extracellular matrix onto the tip, onto the surface of those gels. And then he would plate cells down, and what he saw was that cells would sit on the surface and they would sort of deform it. Um, so he uh, collaborated with a mathematician, Micah Dembo, uh, who developed a method to be able to measure the strains within that, that sort of half space, if you will, of acrylamide gel. So you sort of imagine a thick gel, cell sitting on the top, it's deforming the gel. So the first thing you have to do is figure out how to measure the deformations in the gel. And then what Micah did was took that input and figured out how to measure the, <coughs> calculate the stresses from the, those deformations. So uh, essentially what they did was they, to, to measure the deformations, remember the acrylamide gel is transparent, so you can't really see deformations, is that they uh, polymerized the gel with uh, tiny beads uh, embedded throughout the gel. So now you sort of imagine that as the cells are pulling on the surface, then the beads would move. And uh, they could use those, if they track those beads, they could look at the deformations of the gel that was surrounding those beads. Okay, does that make sense? Um, from that, they, they were able to calculate stresses, and I'll tell you a little bit more about how they do that in a couple slides. Uh, and I just wanted to mention that uh, another uh, group, uh, Benny Geiger's group, uh, soon after developed a method where instead of using acrylamide gels, they went back to use silicones again, uh, except in this time they used lightly cross-linked silicones. So unlike here, we have sort of a hard skin on top of a very soft, li uh, a, a viscous liquid. They would have, a, again, a half plane of gel, just like in the acrylamide case. Um, and what they did was they said, you know, these beads are kind of hard to track. Uh, they're randomly dis uh, organized. And you can imagine that as these beads are being pulled around, if you're trying to track these uh, in a, a pair of images, uh, if one bead now moves to where another bead was, right, you imagine all these density of beads, it's, it's hard to know which bead was which. Was, you know, does that make sense? 
So um, what he did was he actually fabricated onto the surface of this silicone uh, regular dots. So now you don't really have to track them because you sort of know where they came from. They used to be aligned and now as they move out of, uh, out of a grid then you know uh, what kind of deformations there were. So this sort of simplified the tracking problem. Um, so, so the key to this whole process of being able to simplify the problem of taking strains within the material and backing out the stresses relies on the fact that these materials are linear elastic, meaning that as you pull, then you simply have a straight line in terms of the stress and strain. Uh, in other words, the stiffness of the material doesn't change uh, as you pull on it, okay? It turns out that all biological materials are not linear. So uh, here's a, a graph of the, this uh, stress strain uh, done by Paul Janmi uh, many years ago where he looked at all the different types of biological polymers. Um, so I don't know if you can read this, but there's uh, actin, collagen, fibrin, uh, and in all cases what you see is that the, the modulus changes with how much you strain it. So that means it's nonlinear, right? It, it strains, stiffens. Um, so it's sh shown, for example, here, this is the uh, fibrin curve and this is the collagen curve. So you can see they're highly nonlinear. Uh, here's another example. There's the shear modulus, here's the strain, how much strain. And as you strain this uh, material more and more, it becomes much stiffer. Uh, by contrast, here's polyacrylamide, right here. See, it has one stiffness. So it's, it, it's the reason that, this is the reason why we can use this material for doing traction forces. Um, now the reason why the, these biological polymers are not linear for the most part is because they're filamentous, sort of semi-rigid materials. So this is a, a SEM of fibrin. So a cell might be sort of this big, okay? So you can just sort of imagine that you have all of these filaments. The filaments are fairly inflexible. They don't extend very well, but they bend very easily, right? Because they're, they're thin, thin materials. Uh, so what happens is that as you align the material, as you strain it in a certain direction, all of the fibers initially move very easily because they're just bending. You think of spaghetti, easy to bend the, the, the fibers. But as the strain continues to increase, now you have all of these aligned fibers and you reach a point at which the only additional strain that you're getting is not from aligning fibers, but is from stretching the fibers. And so the stretching can become quite stiff. So another example of sort of strain stiffening materials is something like a basketball net or your, the fabrics in your, in your uh, t-shirt. Initially when you pull, it's fairly easy, but as you pull more and more, it becomes tougher and tougher to pull on it, okay? So that, that's the basis for most biological materials. And one of the effects of that is here, shown here. So here's, there's a single cell in this image this single cell is sitting inside on, on this very large gel. And you won't be able to see it, but the cell is sitting inside this red square, uh, this red circle, okay? Uh, so this is a very low magnification image. And what, what uh, Paul did was he measured the elastic modulus locally uh, around this cell. And what you see is that, this is a, on a fibrin gel, that when you're far away, the gel appears quite soft, right, if in small deformation. But as you get closer and closer to the cell, you see the modulus increases dramatically. What's happening is that just around the cell, the cell is pulling on this fiber network, right? So near the cell, the fibers are highly aligned and the material gets stiff. Does that make sense? So in order to solve the problem of now you've got these strains, you can see all the, this is a strain map, these arrows here, and you want to back out the stresses it's impossible. It's impossible because you won't know how much this modulus has changed uh, in, this, in this field. So you have too many variables. Does that make sense? Okay, so what do we do in these linear materials to actually generate st stress maps from strains? 
Um, so for linear materials like acrylamide gel or these silicone rubbers, what we do is we take an image. Uh, this is an image of the focal adhesions, but there would be an image, a similar image of all the beads that are surrounding them. And from looking at the beads, you would back out a, a strain map. Okay. Um, what you then do is you know that there's a very simple equation that basically relates the strains to the stresses, okay? The forces that are needed to deform the gel to give you certain deformations. And that the relationship is here described under this freedom integral. That the transfer function, if you will, involves um, this uh, Green's function, okay? And for linear materials that have a half space and you're trying to deform it on the top of the surface, there's a solution to what the Green's function is. And so given that that's already known, then it's fairly easy to take a stress field, apply the Green's function, integrate it, and then give you the strain fields. It's very easy to go in this forward direction. But it turns out that it's quite difficult to go in the reverse direction. Given a strain field, how do you back out the stresses? And the reason why is because you have to invert this integral. Okay? Um, so, the reason why it's hard, I thought I would just give you an example, is that uh, If you apply a force at a particular point, let's just imagine that the solution to this problem was just one point force that you're applying on the gel. And now you're looking at the strains and you want to back out, and hopefully rescue that point source, okay? So what you might normally see in a gel if you apply a force at this point right here, this might be, and you were tracking beads that were sort of this far away from that point force, this might be the strain field that you would see in a perfect situation, okay? And then if you were to sort of graph that, if this is the point forces right there, you might see deformations that are like this, right? Sort of a nice smooth function. But the reality is that when you do these measurements, there's always noise. You never perfectly find where the bead is because of optical noise, and the bead doesn't always move perfectly because nothing is a perfect material, okay? So what your actual strains will be is some delta off of that position, right? And that's the noise. So now the data that you have looks like this. Right? It's not a perfectly smooth strain map. If you take anything that's noisy, right, and that's on the right side of the integral, and now you want to reverse it, you have to do a, a differentiation, right? Um, then these small strains, these, these little bits of noise get amplified, right? So what you would have to do to say, let's presume that these are perfect measurements. We got this measure that now is this, right? This is the data set that I have. And let's say I presume that this was perfect data. And now I try to solve the, the force field. What you're going to get is not this single point source, right? You're going to get something that looks like this. You'll get a point source here. You have to correct for this delta there, right? So then you'll have another force that's applied here. You'll have to correct for this delta here. You have to put in another force here. To correct for that delta there, you have to put another force here. So now, your stress field that you've calculated is completely different from the real solution. And uh, just because you have decided that your strain field was perfect, so an, another way to look at it is if you put highly, uh, if you constrain the solution to be exact, then your stress field has to be very complicated to account for all of those little bits of noise, right? So let me just go back here. 
This is for four little beads. So I don't know if you can see the dots here, right? But if I want a high resolution image of what the stresses look like, kind of like they've shown here, then there's probably a thousand beads sitting here, maybe 10,000 beads around the cell. So if there's 10,000 sources of noise, can you imagine how many force errors that you're introducing to solve this problem, okay? So what do we do? How do we solve the problem? What we do is we do something that we call regularization. And this is a mathematical version of saying we're cheating, okay? And what we do is we take this, um, we try to minimize this function. Okay, so what is this function? This function is this uh, gf is the exact solution. Okay, and this u is uh, the, the strains that I, I, um, that I want to get. Okay, so the, this squared is just the noise term. It's how far off is my solution. If I take this strain map that I have and I back out forces, then I take my forces and recalculate the strain map. Okay, so that's if I have a perfect solution, then this is zero, right? But for that to be zero, I have to have a very complex force field, remember? So what I can do is I can relax that constraint. I can say, well, I'm okay with having small errors. If I have a point force here and none of the other ones, and I see that when I recover my, my strain field, right, my strain field is going to be close to the strain field that I had measured earlier, but there's going to be some error. Does that make sense? And that error is the difference between my, my, uh, the exact strain field that I measured and my calculated close strain field from my not so good force measurements, uh, my, my force calculations. So I want to minimize that noise, but if I perfectly minimize it, then I'm going to have a very complex force field. What I do is I add to this, I want to not just minimize that because then I'll just have a complex force field. I'm going to add this penalty term. And the penalty term is how complex is the force field. So this is just lambda squared f squared, right? So all I'm doing is I'm putting a penalty in for having a very complex force field. If this force field gets very complicated, I'm going to say that that's not good. That means that I'm sort of overcomplicating the solution. So what have I done by doing this? What I'm doing is I'm assuming that the force field is simple. So what I want to do when I put in this minimization constraint is I'm saying to, to um, my student, I want you to find the simplest force field that kind of approximates the strain field that you've measured. Okay? So how do we do this? This lambda is, um, is a cheat term. And that cheat term is there to let me play around with how much I want to penalize on this force term. So if I make lambda very small, I'm saying I'm OK with a fairly complex field. Because if I have a complex field and this, this lambda is quite small, then that penalty is not so big, right? But if I increase lambda, then what I'm doing is I'm saying I want that force field to be very, very simple, right? Now this lambda is something that we as experimentalists impose on the system to get our solution. So here is an example. This is a, a cell that, that um, a strain field was gathered, a real data set. And then here is the force map that was arrived at based on that strain field when lambda was small. That should say 0.01, when lambda was small. In other words, we said we're okay, we're accepting a more complicated force field because we want the force field to be more accurate at re recovering the strains that we had measured. But I don't think this is real. This is too complicated. 
So what do I do as an experimentalist? I increase my lambda. So I say, you know, I don't like 0.01. Let's try 0.1. Now I've tried 0.1, and you can see now that these forces smooth out. So now I just have forces that are pointing this way on this end, just pointing this way on this end, right? So now I feel pretty happy because all the forces kind of regularize. This is why it's called regularization. They look better, right? But what's happening is by making them look better, I'm actually making the, I'm telling my solution that it's okay not to be as accurate. What happens if this lambda gets very large? What happens is that ultimately you'll end up with two point sources of force, right? This, this will just be one force here and one force here, and everything else will go away. So the problem with this whole method is that as an experimentalist looking at biology as a researcher, we don't know what the forces should look like, right? And here we are playing around with this lambda so that we get an answer that we think feels right. And that doesn't seem like a good way to go about doing experimental science. But this is how the system works. It's the only way to solve the problem. Yeah? You're making the assumption that the noise is random. If it's yes. not random, it's biased, then it needs to work. That's correct. So if there's a bias in your, in your data set, let's, let's say that your light source was not aligned and you're, you're looking at these speeds and in the process your, your light shifts, uh, then all of your beads will show a, a strain in a certain direction that, it, that shouldn't have been there. This method won't capture that at all. So the other thing that people do to deal with systematic noise that's cross-field is they impose a constraint that we know should be true, which is that all of the forces should sum to zero. Now, of course, that constraint cannot be perfect because if we impose it definitely to sum to zero, but at the same time we say that the forces that we solve don't have to perfectly match the strains, it will never perfectly sum to zero either. So what we need is something that says, kind of like in this case, it's sort of close to summing to zero. And again, we have to use one of these lambdas that lets us dial up how much we're willing to tolerate it not summing to zero versus it does sum to zero. So what people do is they say, I want it to sum to less than 10% of the total forces that I'm measuring. Then I feel okay. And some people will say, no, I'd rather sum to 1%. And you get different solutions based on that. So the bottom line is that this method, what you should realize is that the forces that you calculate are not determinate. There are many, many solutions to the same data set that you have in the beginning. Okay? So it is still the predominant method that people use. And the reason why it's the predominant method is because polyacrylamide gels are things that are available. It's a material that all biologists already have in their labs. So it's easy to make the gel, and it's easy to put cells on it, and then you can get something from it. Um, so this is an alternative approach that really was started by Mike Sheets. Um, he said, I don't like this polyacrylamide gel method. It's sort of continuous, and, there's, and I, you might understand why it's a little bit uncomfortable uh, when you're getting your data. Um, so he said, why don't we develop a, a device, a silicon device, silicon, not silicone, okay? Uh, a silicon device that we fabricate so that we can put cells on top of it. And then these devices, these MEMS devices, are designed to measure forces. Uh, people have been using cantilever-based devices that they're sitting in all your iPhones, right? They measure gravity, measure acceleration. So when you're shaking, then you have a sensor that says, oh, I'm shaking. Th that's what those devices are designed for. So you can make one of these that's for cells. So what he did was he made uh, a pad that would sit up coplanar with the top surface of the substrate and then have this long cantilever 
uh, you see that it goes underneath the substrate. So it's not on the surface. So the cell only sees this area and then that pad. But all of this stuff underneath is, is in a tunnel that's, that's underneath the top surface. So what happens is that now when a cell, I don't know if you can see this, there's a cell sitting here that's just started to crawl up to the top of this cantilever. And when the cell starts to crawl over it, it is forming adhesions on that cantilever. And you can see that uh, as the, the front of the cell is going over it, you see this force that comes up and you can measure the force over time uh, as the cell is crawling over the thing. That force measurement is direct, right? It's not calculating something that you're guessing. You're just looking at the deflection of the cantilever and that backs out the force. Um, so that was a very, uh, in my mind, sort of a, a key breakthrough in this field. Um, the only limitation here was that I remember when Mike first debuted this technique, he told us that he put cells down. You can see there's maybe uh, a pad here, a pad here, and, and there might be you know, a few hundred of these on a surface. Um, so when you put a cell down, you might get lucky when the cell is crawling around and happens to go over this pad. Uh, and then you quickly record, right? Uh, but there's lots of area here that, that doesn't have a sensor. That's one. Number two is that you can only measure the force in this direction, right? So if the cell is going this way and we want to measure the force in this axis, we can't measure it. So in some sense, this limited what we could do with the substrate, just in terms of throughput and, and these other things. But it was from, from that inspiration that we came up with this idea of building cantilevers that are not in plane, but are vertical. So what we did was we bas basically made uh, a device or a, a template that had vertical cantilevers. Uh, so the way that you make these sorts of things, it's very difficult to make these things in rubbers, but it's very easy to do this in lithography, right? So we use this uh, plastic SU-8 um, where it's photo photo um, cross-linked. So what you do is you pour that material on top of a silicon, again, C-O-N, silicon wafer, because silicon is, is flat. Uh, and then you shine light through these little pinholes. The, the light then polymerizes uh, a pillar. And you can see the, these pillars, turns out, are not perfectly vertical. You notice that they're kind of pointing, they're, they're a little bit conical. And they're conical because the light that was coming in through those, those pinholes was not perfectly conical. I mean, not perfectly vertical, okay? Uh, and from that, you can basically generate a large array of these uh, uh, pillars, if you will. Uh, then what we do is we then template those. So you pour PDMS, which is a silicone that you can cross-link chemically, and you, you pour it all over the substrate. Um, polymerize it, and then you literally just peel it off. You peel it off and you're left with holes, right? And then what we do is we pour another layer of silicone into these holes, and uh, then once that polymerizes, you can peel that off and you're left with basically this substrate now in an, in an elastomer, something that's linear elastic, okay? So with this, you can generate all kinds of patterns. You can make, for example, pillars that are not round. So you can imagine if a pillar is not round, then the forces to pull in one direction versus the other are not the same. It's anisotropic. And Benoit Ledoux has been using these kinds of substrates to now look at what happens if forces, uh, the stiffness of the sur surface is not isotropic. Um, and you can also vary, for example, the stiffness of the pillars by just varying the height of the pillars. You can imagine that if the pillars are very tall, then it's very easy to bend them. And by sort of simple linear beam theory, you know that as you increase the length, the stiffness of that pillar decreases by length cubed. Okay? You can also vary the diameter, and the diameter also, of course, uh, dramatically affects the stiffness of the pillars. Um, so these are sort of different ways in which you can sort of play with this kind of substrate. So when we actually first started putting cells onto these devices, the first thing that you'll notice is that the cells 
kind of crawl canopy over the pillars and sort of fall down into the substrate. Um, so you can see, for example, the cell is sort of adhering to the bottom surface here. So if a cell does that, you can't really measure forces because this is sort of ill-defined. What you really want to do is you want to put the cells on it so that the cells stay on the tips of the, of the pillars. Why? Because, again, in a, in a beam, if you apply a load here versus if you apply a load here, obviously the stiffness of the pillar will feel very different. And we want to specify where it's pulling, right? We want it to pull from the tip. So the way that we do that is that, um, at least we did initially, we would take PDMS uh, stamps and ink them with matrix, something adhesive, and then you would print the matrix down onto the pillars. So now that just the pillar tips are coated, right? And then what we would do is we would block the rest of the surface, the bottom and the side shafts of these pillars with non-adhesives so that when cells attach, they will only stick on the tips. And you can see that here. So the nice thing about this tool is that you can directly determine forces. There's nothing indeterminate about this system. Anytime you see a pillar bend, then you know that there's a net force on that pillar, right? And so from that, you can see here in this movie, we were just showing um, cell just crawling around and generating contractile uh, stresses. And what we do is we simply look at, I don't know if you can see the grid, there are these little dots here. Those dots are us measuring the center of those pillars. And so as those pillars move, then we can simply multiply by the stiffness of the pillar to back out the force. So this going from the image to the force is really, 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 really easy. And so this, this takes a few minutes to code this. And then you can, in real time, while you're taking images of your cells, have the force move, um, uh, map with you. So what is the scale of this? Uh, in this case, this is, um, our original pillars were quite big, um, but these ones now are about one micron diameter, uh, a few micron spacings. So one cell will span across between maybe 100 and 1,000 of these. And how much do they move? How much do they move? So obviously that depends on the stiffness of the pillars and how much the cells are generating force. Um, we typically see deformations between, I want to say, 50 nanometers to a micron. And that, that's sort of the range, right? And that's where we want them to be. Um, below 50 nanometers, it's quite hard to see. And above a micron, then for the pillar heights that we typically use, which are several microns, then the pillar starts to deflect enough that you worry about nonlinear effects. Okay. Uh, so we usually dial the stiffness of our, of our pillars to be such that they deflect uh, a little bit. Um, and you expect the cell to behave simil in a similar way if it was on a continuous uh, raw material versus on a discrete channel? So that, that was certainly a question when we started this work. Um, so far, most of the things that we've seen, the cells behave very similarly. Um, so what, what changes that is if your pillars are quite far apart, then obviously when a cell is trying to attach and spread, then it's harder for it to hop from one, one post to the next, right? But if the pillars are pretty close together like this relative to the size of the cell, then it, it's not really uh, being hampered, right? Now, as Mike said, uh, all natural matrices are not continuous surfaces. They're, they're fibular structures, right? And so in some ways, I think cells are already naturally designed to be able to jump through space. Um, there are obviously differences. There have to be differences. Um, so in some ways, uh, some of the data that, that Mike showed in the last lecture actually addresses that. For example, when we vary the stiffness of our pillars, we're varying the, the macroscopic stiffness, right? How much flexibility or rigidity is there between pillars? That's what the cell would be feeling. But then on a single molecule level, the stiffness of the PDMS is, of course, the same 
across these different substrates. Whereas on a continuous material, if we vary the stiffness, the way we're doing it is we're changing the molecular cross-linking density. So that affects the nanometer scale flexibility of the material as well as the kind of macroscopic. So that they're, they're a little bit different, but the, for us, the biology, the cells seem to treat them fairly similarly. Um, so some of the advantages are also that you can pattern the matrix. So for example, just based on this, right, we can print down regions to be adhesive and non-adhesive. And that's very useful for my group because we're interested in studying some of these effects of cell shape. And I'll show you an example of that. For acrylamide gels or other sort of soft gels, if you try to print on them, you damage the gel. The, the physical contact can uh, fracture the gel. Um, the other thing is that uh, obviously discrete sensors is a positive and a negative, right? Uh, and as you said, it's a discontinuous surface and that can be a positive or negative depending on what you're trying to look at. Um, so it, it sort of depends on the situation whether you would reach out to use this tool versus reach out to use another one. Um, so I thought what I would do is just tell you a very, very short story about some of the tool use that we've had uh, with this. One of the areas that my group is studying is how cell shape regulates cell function. And the reason why we're interested in this is in the context of development, uh, this is a Drosophila embryo. Uh, there's lots of changes in cell shape as cells are kind of squishing and stretching and moving uh, in order to get to where they want to go, in order to, to change tissue structure. And um, we also know from work that was done by uh, Judah Folkman many, many years ago that as cells attach on surfaces, um, as they change their shape, they change their behavior. So. Uh, we were sort of interested in this link between shape and behavior. So uh, we were studying this cell called the mesenchymal stem cell. It's a human, uh, this is a human cell that is derived from bone marrow. And now people have found these stem cells all over your body. Uh, and they, they basically are stromal cells that can differentiate into bone or cartilage or fat. Um, and we were interested in sort of understanding whether changes in cell shape, again, thinking about this developmental context, would change how they behave. What we found was that we, we were using patterns to control cell shape. What we would do is we would print extracellular matrix onto flat surfaces, and you could plate cells down on top of it. And if we could change the, the size of the spot, as you would, that the cell attaches on, then you would change its shape. So if a cell was sitting on a very small spot, it would remain largely spherical. If the cell was sitting on a large spot, then it would sort of flatten out like a pancake. And what we found was that when we did that, the cells that were round would differentiate into fat cells, adipocytes. And when the cells were very well spread, they would differentiate into bone cells or osteoblasts. Uh, and you can see here, as we change the island size, there's this sort of switch in the commitment of the cells to different lineages. Um, so we thought that was pretty interesting. Um, it turned out that what we had found was that as the cells were able to spread out, they would turn on this protein uh, called Rho-A. And this Rho-A is very important for driving changes in cytoskeletal organization and activating myosin. And so we had postulated that this activation of myosin would generate tension, and that tension was somehow important for this sensing of switch to switch between these two different cell types. But even though we had implicated Rho, for us to then leap forward and say it was definitely a forced mediated response, we have to be able to measure the tension in these cells. Okay? And then related to that, one of my colleagues at, at Penn, Dennis Disher, had shown that if you take these same cells and you put them onto substrates with different stiffnesses, then as the cells were sitting on stiffer and stiffer substrates, they would again switch to different lineages. They become bone as they are on stiff surfaces, uh, and they would become other cell types as they were on softer surfaces. Um, and of course, that was very interesting because we know in our own bodies that all of our tissues are different stiffnesses. Cells uh, that live in fat tissue are in a very soft environment. Cells in the brain are in a very soft environment. Cells in muscle in a 
a little stiffer environment. Cells in bone obviously are in a very stiff environment. So perhaps these changes in the mechanics of the local environment are something that cells can sense in a way that allows these stem cells to differentiate into the right lineages. Of course, for us, we had this question of whether these two findings were really linked, whether these changes in cell shape and what we thought was contractility was related to this effect of substrate stiffness on differentiation. So what we did was we took our pillars and we varied the height of the pillars to change the stiffness. So you can imagine that if you have short pillars, again, cells are sitting on a stiffer substrate than if they're on a, soft, on a tall pillar. And what we found was, indeed, when they're sitting on the short pillars, they would differentiate into bone. When they were on soft pillars, they would differentiate into fat. So now here's the interesting thing. Um, when we looked at the cells, they changed shape. So when the cells are sitting on the soft surfaces, they remain basically spherical. Uh, and when they are on the stiff surfaces, they spread and flatten very nicely, okay? Uh, and here are SEMs. You'll notice that the scale bars are different, but basically you can see that the cells are quite different in their, their structure. Yeah? I have a question. If we shift the cell from the rigid surface to the soft surface, will it get rounded? Ah, so yes. If we, but to do that, we have to detach the cell, right, which means putting it into suspension and then putting it on this surface, and then it doesn't spread. That's right. We don't have a way of making this substrate, while the cell is still sitting on it, make it soft and see what happens. But if we move it, yes. Um, in fact, I'll tell you, this, this, this is maybe uh, an interesting piece of, of data, but uh, these cells become bone and these cells become fat, right? It takes about a week for them to turn into these cell types. Um, so one thing that we did was that we would take these cells and culture them on these surfaces, and then after a day, two days, three days, or four days, we would lift them off the surface and switch them. Because we wanted to know when was the decision to differentiate versus when did they actually execute the differentiation program. And what we found was that at around day three to day four, they made the decision. So in other words, if we took the cell here and we put it over here on day two, uh, they would become fat. But if we did the same experiment where we moved them at day four, they would still become bone. So they're sensing these stiffness uh, for a period of time, then they make a decision. Now, when we took that data set, now recall that these are all on pillars, so we can measure the forces on all of these situations. What we find is that when the cells are sitting on the uh, stiffer substrates, then the cells would spread out. And you can sort of see the mean spreading is here, in this case, about 6,000 uh, microns squared. And when the cells are sitting on the soft surface, you can see that the mean is quite small, right? Um, but if we graphed the amount of focal adhesions that they made for every cell, what we found is that regardless of whether they're on rigid, medium, or soft, what predicted how much focal adhesions that they formed was how well spread they were. So as the cells were more spread, then they would generate more focal adhesions. And the reason why I say that the stiffness wasn't really the driver here is that, uh, in terms of affecting focal adhesions, was that you would have some cells sitting on this sur surface that were less spread, right? and some cells over here that were more spread. And those that were more spread had more adhesions, and those that were here that were less spread had less adhesions. Yeah? Um, I have a question. So before the cells are seeded onto the microvilla, I, mean, the, uh, I believe they are grown in culture plus. So culture plus itself is, the surface is uh, rigid. rigid. Yes. So what is different from the culture plus, uh, I mean, that prevents the cells from the oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So I, that, that's a great question. So these cells, when you culture them, there's a special media that you use to propagate them that prevents them from differentiating. So then when we put them on these substrates, we change the media to allow them to differentiate. So it, it's the, what's in the soluble mix that triggers this beginning to differentiate. And so then we add that when the cells are already on the substrate that we want.
Sorry that that wasn't clear. Um, and then if we look at the traction forces, you see the same thing. The amount of force they generate is predicted by how well spread they were. Now here you can see that the, the data sets are spread out a little bit. When the cells are sitting on the stiff surfaces, they're on a slightly higher uh, um, absolute values than when they're on the softer surfaces, which are over here. So what this tells you is that traction force, how much force they generate, is mostly determined by cell spread area, if you think of it as a principal component, and also a little bit, even when they're spread to the same area, then there's a little bit of an effect from the stiffness. So uh, this is starting to tell us a little bit about how cells are using these different kinds of, uh, of um, environmental cues to decide what to do. So we had this model that uh, when cells bind to a surface, they're sort of sensing the stiffness, as Mike alluded to initially. And that stiffness then affects how well spread they are. And as they decide to spread out and flatten on the surface, that ultimately drives how much force they generate. That force generation then impacts adhesion assembly. Okay? And in our system, the mesenchymal stem cells, we think that the adhesion assembly, in fact, impacts how these cells sense growth factors within the media to then signal and drive different kinds of differentiation programs. So this is how the mechanical environment is sort of linked to the biochemical environment in the cell. So um, you can see here is uh, an example where we add these differentiation factors when the cells are sitting on a surface that they're well spread. As soon as they see that, they start to increase their contractility. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip over a slide here and show you that if we look at the differentiation, as the cells are um, starting to differentiate over days and we track the, the amount of force that they generate, what we find is that the cells that become bone increase their contractility within the first day. And the cells that don't differentiate don't increase their contractility. So in fact, remember I told you that it took them about three days to decide which lineage to become. But by the first day, they already changed their mechanics. So we think that the mechanical response in some ways predicts what they're going to do uh, later. Oops, sorry, I skipped the slide. Um, so interestingly, if you now drive contractility, you can drive the differentiation of the cells. So if we increase contractility by turning on that row protein to turn on myosin in a cell that is just sitting on a substrate, it starts them to contract. They, they immediately turn on the genetic program to become bone. If we block the contractility so the cells relax, they now become fat. So this shows you how this whole system of adhesion, spreading, contractility is all related to a differentiation program. And as I had told you at the beginning of the talk, we think that those um, forces are not just used for mechanical purposes, but are used for, for biochemistry as well. Um, so all of these tools that, that we have now to measure traction forces, whether these are acrylamide gels or, or microposts, in my view, we're, we're really enabling for the field to now start to link mechanical forces to cell function. But one of the um, big questions is that all of this was based on using planar substrates. And as I had shown you in examples, in morphogenesis, cells aren't always on a surface. Sometimes they're embedded within a material and they're sort of pulling. And by changing the dimensionality of the situation, the boundary conditions, maybe the mechanics change, right? So what we'd really like to do is also measure those forces when cells are sort of within a 3D environment and see what happens. Um, so there have been some attempts to do this. And uh, recall, that um, when cells are plated into biological polymers, that 
you can't solve this problem because the cells, you can't back out the uh, stresses from the strains. But you can still measure the strains. Um, so what, what um, Ben Fabry did was he put cells inside collagen or fibrin gels with beads in them. And from that, you can track the beads and you can get a strain map. So what he's done is he said, you know what? We can get strain maps and we can't measure the stresses. But we might be able to at least estimate the strain energy within the system. How much is the cell doing work into the substrates? We're not sure. He and I have talked about this. We're not sure if those estimates are accurate because the str remember that the uh, material strain hardens. I'm sorry, strain stiffens. <laughs> and, and so as you, stiff, as you uh, pull and deform the material, then uh, incrementally, as you pull a little bit harder, the amount of work to go from here to here is quite a bit higher than going from here to here. And so uh, he hasn't really figured out yet how to incorporate the nonlinearity into these calculations. So the key to be able to get stresses from strains, if you recall, is linearity within the material, linear deformations. So what we did is we said, well, acrylamide gels, as much as I find them difficult, at least they're linear elastic materials. And so if we could find a way to develop a linear elastic material that's like acrylamide gels, but instead of putting cells on top of it, you could put cells inside. You can't do that with acrylamide because acrylamide's toxic. So what we did was we used polyethylene glycol as a monomer. And polyethylene glycol is not toxic. And we simply cross-link that gel with cells around uh, inside it. If you do that, what happens is that the cells kind of stay um, inside the gel, but the cells stay spherical. Why? Because polyacrylamide gels and polyethylene glycol gels are non-adhesive, remember? So if the cell can't stick to it, then it's not going to generate any forces. Um, so what you have to do is you have to put adhesive materials onto the uh, polyethylene glycol backbone. Um, the way that they do this now with polyacrylamide gels is they form the gel, then on the surface they coat it with a crosslinker and then capture matrix onto it. Well, because we're now putting cells inside the gel, we can't crosslink it after we put the cells there because that would be toxic. So we have to somehow put the adhesive material directly into the monomer and then polymerize it. So the way we do that is we take uh, small, short peptides that are fragments of extracellular matrix molecules that we know bind to cells, and we couple them covalently into the gel. So now what we do is we have that adhesive moiety, we put the cells in, we mix the, everything as monomers, we polymerize it, and now the cells can grab onto the gel. And what we found is that the cells still didn't generate much force, and they stayed spherical. And what you re realize is that cells, even though they can adhere to the gel, they can't spread in the gel. Because the gel, remember, the pore sizes of gels are on the order of nanometers to maybe a micron. And so the cell can't even extend processes into the gel because it can't snake through the, the holes, the pores. It has to actually be able to cut into the gel to then spread through it. So we have to find a way to make our polyethylene glycol in a form that cells can dig through it. So what we did was we took the polyethylene gly glycol background, which is shown here, backbone, and we embedded inside the backbone another peptide. And this peptide comes from collagen. It's a peptide that colli in collagen that cells cut as they dig through things. So they use these uh, metalloproteases in order to dig through matrices. So we simply put that into the material. So now when cells are attached, they spread into the material and they cut through it, and now they can generate force. And so this is how we do that. Just to show you the, the sort of uh, uh, mechanical characterization, you can see that the modulus, the, the stiffness of the material, doesn't change with the strain of the material, right? So it's not strain hardening. It's just like polyacrylamide gels. It's well behaved. So shown here is a data set. We have lots of beads now in 3D uh, with a cell sitting inside that's spreading into the gel, right? So we have to track those beads. And of course, this is a little bit more challenging because now we have to do confocal stacks throughout this structure, this volume, to find where all the beads are. And 
If we want high resolution, we need more beads and we have to do finer stacks. Um, once we have all the beads, you can imagine in a stressed state, you have beads in a certain position and to de-stress them to find out where the zero stress state is, on a 2D gel, the way you do that is you detach the gels. You detach the cells. So the cells are sitting on a surface, they have certain bead positions, you detach the cell, the, the beads all move, and now you know the zero stress state, right? But the way we do this in 3D is you can't detach the cell, so you have to kill the cell. What we do is we just add detergent. So when you add detergent, the cell blows up. I mean, not literally, but the membranes dissolve and the, the proteins all leach out and you get the zero stress state. Now, the hardest part of this was having this array of beads before the motion and this array of beads after, two pictures, and now you gotta figure out which bead was which so you can get the strains. And so the way that you do that is you basically take each bead and you ask, where are the positions of all of its neighbors? And so you generate sort of a, a 3D, um, kind of like a fi finite element mesh of where everything is. And then you do the same after the, str uh, the strain has been removed. And what you find is that the shapes of all of these different uh, structures, right, that are, are um, due to the just random position of all the beads, every shape is unique. And so from that, you can sort of find out how to register the two images and find the strains. Um, once you have the strains, then you can start to calculate the stresses. So the first thing you have to do, in, in our case, is that you have to generate a finite element model of the material itself. And the reason why you have to do that is because the cell has a unique shape inside this structure. Right? Think of it as a void, it's just a hole in there, and you're pulling on the surface of that void. Well, that means that you have to generate kind of this model of what the, the gel looks like with that hole inside for that particular situation. For the 2D situation, it's always a half uh, space. So you just have to do it once. But here, for every time the you get a, uh, an image, you have to then redraw what the cell looks like and regenerate a new finite element model of that gel. Once you have it, then if you have the deformations of all the beads and where they are, then you can generate the strain maps, right? And then from that strain map, so here's a strain map, you can see the positions of all the beads and sort of how they moved in response to this, this cell. Then we generate that finite element model of the surrounding hydrogel. We can build a Green's function for that particular hydrogel. Yeah? Uh, we do because our bead density within the gel is very high. So we know where the void is because there's no beads in there. Oh, so you actually trace the voids of the yeah. gel. Yeah, that's right. And, and we do that on every section, so then you build a 3D space. Um, and that's, so then you generate your Green's function for that particular geometry, right? Uh, and then from that, you do your inversion to get to the stresses. So it's essentially the same mathematics as we did for the 2D, and it's just that you have to add a couple of extra things. One is you have to customize your Green's function for every particular geometry, and then the rest of it is basically the same. Um, so what you find is that when cells are sitting inside these gels is that you see similar kinds of forces. The forces tend to be high near the tips of the cells, which is the way we see it in 2D, and the forces tend to be pointing back towards the center of the cell. They never push into the gel, they always pull, again, just like you would expect in, in 2D. One of the really interesting findings that we had was that when the cells are sitting uh, inside the, the gel as single cells, they always pull inwards. But Occasionally, for example here, and this, this was a very large tumor mass, when we grow cells into little clusters, they could apply pressures, they could push out into the gel. And you can see here, they're sort of pushing out. Uh, so you can sort of change the mechanical stress uh, environment when the cells are single cells versus multiple cells. <laughs>
Uh, and we don't understand how that happens. So we're trying to figure out how that, that what makes that work. Uh, this is not just cell growth. So for example, if we look at uh, MDCKs, they form acinar structures. You, they'll form them in the absence of growth, but you'll still get pressures. In that case, we think that the pressures are driven by the um, osmotic. the osmotic pumps. So they're pumping fluid into the center of the structure and that pushes outwards. In the case of the cancer cells, if we stop the proliferation, the, the stresses are stable. They're still there. But if we um, stop it early, then they don't grow to form that pressure. So in that case, of course, the proliferation is driving that. So uh, an example of how we're using this sort of 3D methods. Again, I wanted to show that to you so you just sort of, my goal is for you to sort of uh, understand how the methods work and not feel intimidated by them and, and understand how you could incorporate those. Um, I just want to show you briefly one last thing. I know we've gone a little bit over, but hopefully I've been answering questions all along. Um, is that, you know, forces drive massive reorganizations, right, uh, within these uh, developmental contexts. What I showed you right now are sort of single cell motions where there's just a little bit of, of deformations. And those are very easy to measure with these gels and these other types of uh, substrates that I've shown you because they all behave linearly when you have small deformations. But when you have very large deformations, then uh, as far as we know right now, it's impossible to get these high resolution stress maps. Um, because there's just too much motion. Um, so um, again, just to show you sort of an example of, this is a neurogenesis, just the formations of these structures are very large uh, changes in, in uh, the organization. So one model that people have used to sort of study this is actually a very, very simple model, is looking at collagen and how it contracts into different types of shapes. So if you take a collagen gel and you put cells in it, cells will contract the gels. And they normally contract it to about 10% of the original volume. And they'll contract it into a little sphere, sort of a tight ball. And what you can do is you can pin the, the you can see here there's four pins here. You can pin these gels so that as they're contracting, they get anchored to these, to these uh, anchor points. And what happens then is then the collagen starts to contract and it starts to sort of align and form these sort of web-like patterns. And we were sort of interested, this had been described again, actually by Albert Harris and, and uh, Sopak uh, early in the 80s. Uh, but they hadn't been able to quantify these, these sorts of motions, and we wanted to measure the forces. So what we did was we used our fabrication tools to, again, build elastomeric pillars. In, case, in this case, they're quite large. These are, uh, instead of one micron diameter, they're sort of like 50 micron diameter, right? And this uh, dimension is more on the order of uh, several hundred microns. So that what would happen is that you could fit inside here a collagen gel with maybe 50, 100, 500 cells uh, into, that, into that gel. And what happens is, as you can see, when you first seed the cells, they're distributed inside the collagen gel, and then they start to contract the gel. And you can see the gel gets pinned by these anchors, and they start to, to align the collagen fibers. And you can start to see that the pillars start to bend inwards, right? And as they bend inwards, you can back out the forces that are being generated. Um, so we've been using this to just sort of make what I would call sort of like a, a little micro tissue and studying the forces of that process. Uh, and you can see here, if we add LPA, which is an agent that will increase contractility. You see this very rapid increase in contractility. If we add blebustatin, then it sort of dissipates. One of the reasons why we liked to use this kind of miniaturization was that we don't have to deal with diffusion limitations of small molecules that we're adding into the media. We want it to, to penetrate into the tissue very quickly so we can sort of see what happens. So one of the applications that we've been using this for is to make cardiac tissues. So what we do is we take uh, um, cardiac cells and put them into these structures, and they contract, uh, again, into these sort of dog bone-shaped structures. The cells align, 
And because they compact the collagen, they get very close to each other. And as they get close to each other, in the case of cardiac cells, they'll form tight cell-cell uh, junctions. What those tight cell-cell junctions do is it allows the cardiac cells to now electrically couple. So you can see here that um, initially when these things form, you see these, this is a calcium uh, imaging. You can see these little sparks, right, that are turning on. But in general, the, the cells are kind of decoupled from each other. Um, but over time, you can see that once they get connected, when, these guys, when any one of these activates, it causes a calcium wave throughout the structure, and the whole thing contracts as a single unit. And when they contract as a unit, you can see here, we have these things moving, and from that you can back out, again, a trace of the forces that are generated. So the reason why we're using this system is now we can model sort of the static tension, how much there is, is there when the cells are relaxed. They're not really fully relaxed, it's just a diastolic tension. Um, and then as they beat, then they generate this kind of pulse, and we want to study that wave. So, oops. so one of the nice things about this model is that when the cells form this 3D band, right, they're now in kind of a three-dimensional aligned tissue structure. And you can see here that that alignment, what it does to the cardiac cells is it allows them to form these cell-cell contacts and really elongate. And when they do, then you can see these sarcomeres that um, Mike was talking about. In cardiac cells, those sarcomeres are highly regular and organized, right? And in, in non-muscle cells, it's not the case. But you can see that here, you see this banding pattern. You can actually measure the distance from one uh, uh, spot to another, and that tells you the length of the sarcomeres that are being formed. So why are we studying this? We're really interested in the mechanical responses of cardiac cells to, to external environmental changes. So what I want to show you here is that when we increase the matrix stiffness, in all of our 2D surfaces, what happens? You increase the stiffness, and the cells become more contractile, right? Uh, when we increase the stiffness here, you see that the cells become less contractile. So what's happening? Is it just that there's something about 3D-ness that makes them sense stiffness differently? Uh, it turns out that we don't think that that's the case. What I think is happening is that when we increase the tissue stiffness, the stiffness of the material that the cell is sitting in, now the cell may try to contract harder, but it's more difficult to contract the tissue. So if you will, the cell is now doing more work to just deform the tissue, which means less work is being applied to the external pillars, which is what we're measuring, right? So another way of thinking about this is if you have a cardiac tissue and it infarcts, if, it get, if you get a heart attack, that wall region that is not getting oxygen starts to fibrose. It becomes stiffer. And what ultimately happens is that even though you have cells in there that are kind of trying to contract, that part of the wall stops moving because the tissue has gotten stiff. And in, in the cardiac world, we call that sort of uh, con concretization. So that it's like it's becoming more concrete instead of something soft. So that's bad. Now our goal is trying to study the mechanics in a way that we would find what are the positive effects and what are the negative effects. So here's another interesting piece of data. If we increase the stiffness of the pillars, then we see this really nice increase in contractility of the, the tissue. So here what we're doing is we're just changing the stiffness of the external device, right? The constraints that the cell is, is sitting in. Now the cells respond to that. They sense that there's something stiffer on the outside and they start contracting more against that surface. So what is that? In some ways that's like increasing your blood pressure. You're not changing the mechanics of your heart itself, the tissue. What you're doing is you're changing this external boundary of, of pressure that the heart now has to pump against. And it turns out that it's very well described that one of the unique properties of heart tissue is that when it gets stretched or when it gets expanded due to blood pressure, it contracts harder. And that feedback loop is actually critical 
when you first stand up and you start running, the heart has to immediately be able to react by pumping harder. Otherwise, it's going to blow up. Okay? How are you changing uh, matrix stiffness? Uh, we change the collagen density. Uh, you can also do it by changing the collagen cross-linking. So uh, that locally changes the stiffness in the matrix, but it doesn't do anything to the external boundary. Um, Chris, how do these forces or stresses compare to uh, in vivo, regular heart muscle? Uh, so the stiffnesses that we've measured are... I mean the, the forces that are... Kind of oh, how, how much force can they generate? Yeah. Right now, these tissues are generating a... Not bad, maybe a quarter to a third of what we measure in an adult heart. Um, so it, it's within reason. Um, the reason why we think that it's not reached the same level is that in, in cardiac tissue in the heart, uh, the measurements have been made in adults and people that have had 20 years of exercise uh, induced improvements. And so if we look at these guys, this is after a week. And I imagine that if we waited a year, that they would get stronger. Yeah. So if you would put LPA in the increased stiffness condition, yeah. as a kind of post would you still expect to decrease? It's a great question. We haven't done it. So LPA is a really nice manipulation because it will increase the basal contractility, the black bars, and it shouldn't affect this, this external pump. But if it does, then that means that the cell is sensing this uh, sort of non-muscle myosin tension and the effect of that on the cardiac muscle tension. So yeah, it's a really interesting question. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff to do that we haven't gotten to yet. Um, so one of the other cool things that you can do with this kind of system is that you can put in different numbers of pillars and you can sort of change the structure. So for example, here, if we have four pillars, instead of having a really aligned tissue, now you have something that looks like a planar tissue. It has sort of um, biaxial stress. Uh, and what you find is that if you look at the stresses here versus here, the stresses here are going to be much higher. Uh, because it's very close to this, this post, right, that the cells are contracting against. And what was interesting is that when we started to stain for different kinds of matrix proteins, and we were doing that just to look at the matrix itself, what we found is that fibronectin is uh, concentrated in these areas of high stress. We found, in fact, a lot more remodeling by the cells in these areas of high stress. So what we realized, and we didn't do this up front, but after the fact, we realize that this model is a really nice model to look at gradients of stress within a tissue and seeing how cells respond to local gradients. And so now we're, we're starting to use this to try to, to study whether cells can sense those things locally. Um, I guess I should also mention, sorry, uh, that this is work that we're now doing with Viola Vogel. Uh, at ETH. So she has, uh, and I bring this up because this is yet another approach, um, she has this FRET sensor where she's made a fibronectin molecule uh, that has uh, fluorophores in it so that when it's in a closed conformation, when the fibronectin is not stretched, you have very high FRET. But then as the molecule gets stretched, then the fluorophores get pulled away from each other and FRET decreases. So she's been using this to look at how fibronectin is stretched by cells. And so we talked to her because we measure forces, but we can't do this at a molecular level. And we put her FRET sensor into these constructs. And what we found is that um, as these constructs develop, they do increase their forces. And we can see that the FRET ratio on the fibronectin <coughs> decreases, meaning that there's more and more stress on the fibronectin uh, as this stuff is developing. And so uh, I bring that up to again show you how a lot of these sort of, I'll call them mechanical devices and tools, can give you some direct measures of force, but it's really coupling them to these sort of molecular approaches of looking at how specific molecules are being stretched or not stretched. And, and Mike showed some of that in his talk. I think that's um, going to be a very interesting mix of uh, research that's coming out on. These are presumably fibronectin fibers that is, are assembled onto the collagen yes. gel yes. in the background. That's right. 
So there are some on the collagen gel, but interestingly, they're also replacing the uh, collagen gel that we put in there in the first place. So as the cells are contracting the gel, they're templating new fibronectin on the collagen, getting rid of the old collagen, and then templating new collagen on top of the fibronectin. So there's this big feedback loop between the matrix production and the sensing of what's already there, and it's stress mediated. And so it's really complicated, unfortunately, which means it's going to take us a long time to figure out how it all happens. Yeah. Um, so uh, just to end, um, I hope I've given you sort of some insights into sort of the different types of tools that we currently have available to sort of measure these kinds of forces, um, all the way from kind of basic materials to these sort of molecular sensors. Um, and uh, in all of those cases, what we really want to get at is trying to understand how forces are driving functional responses in cells and how forces drive changes in cell structure and multicellular organization. Um, so on the one hand, there's sort of the principles that we're learning about how there are these links between cell structure and forces and adhesions and multicellular architecture. They're all sort of linked to each other. And those links, we feel, are really important in connecting how cell tissue mechanics and structure are related to cell and tissue organization and function. Um, so that's sort of a uh, sort of biological insight, if you would. But I would also like to point out that the tools that we have to study these processes are really just starting to kind of uh, come online. And I feel like there's a lot of opportunity amongst the engineers to develop even better tools to try to get at these things. Because you can see we're still a little bit uh, distant between the sort of basic biological systems and our force measurement tools. And we're sort of trying to figure out how to get those things closer together. Uh, do you have any questions? <laughs>